Hey everyone, welcome back to the Whispers of Terror channel, where we dive deep into the spine-chilling stories that keep you up at night. For those dealing with mysterious creatures, if any of you are reading this, why do you do it? Besides the money, I think many of you do it for the thrill, for the adrenaline. But where's the line? When does excitement turn into panic? Don't get me wrong, a little risk-taking is good for the soul, but in any situation, there are just too many things that can go wrong. Especially when you're in a dark forest. Right again. You are a wonder, boy. I've been in there visiting friends. The laughter returned, a sound that seemed to fill the entire forest. Yes, sir. I was just visiting with some good old buddies of mine who followed in my footsteps. Just visiting. He leaned closer to my small figure, his breath hot and foul. But there comes a time to leave, and my time came. As enjoyable as the company was to me, you can't expect me to stay there a lifetime. Sure you can't, but others might have different ideas. So here I am, moving along at night and running into you. Now as for your help, boy. Well, I don't know right offhand, but it will come. It will come. You keep real quiet and let's have a look at this church you left to find me. The man kept a tight grip on one arm but let me lead him to the edge of the forest. We stared across the blacktop surrounding the church. The light from the stained glass windows revealed only a few dozen cars huddled close to the building. Sunday evening services were attended only by the elderly, the newly converted, and a handful of the always faithful. It was hard for me to believe that just minutes earlier I had purposely left such a warm, safe place. I wanted to cry, but my fear went beyond tears. My small brow wrinkled with effort as I tried to radiate promises of everlasting goodness for a bit of help in the present. The man squatted beside me while the strangely emotional voice from inside the church washed over us unheard. Even when the man spoke an inch from my ear, I couldn't look at him. A pretty little church. Pretty. Not too large, but large enough for the faithful in a town this size. And large enough for me to find what I need to leave this place forever. I see some stairs there in the back, my boy. Do you know where they lead? I thought for a moment, my mind racing. It's a little room for the singers, the choir. That's where they put on their robes. The man tightened his grip on my arm, his fingers like iron. Perfect. Exactly as I thought, but it needed you to be sure. A nice little choir room where they get ready to sing their praises. Do you remember seeing ladies' pocketbooks there? Purses. Boy, where they keep their money and car keys. When I nodded, the man embraced me quickly before turning me to face him directly. Inches apart, I couldn't see both of the man's eyes without turning my head. The breath from the warm-like lips was overpowering, a stench that made me want to gag. I quivered in the man's arms, ready to faint, but the man shook me to attention. Now listen carefully, boy for your life depends on you hearing and obeying what I'm about to ask. He turned his head slightly toward the church as if to keep one eye there while the other remained tightly on my pale face. Think of a lady in that choir, sitting right now behind the preacher, her hands in her lap waiting for the next hymn to be sung. Think of one in particular for me, boy, one who drives a nice big car you couldn't help but remember. The man turned me back to face the cluster of cars. Maybe she drives that green one there or the black one next to it. Just pick out one that belongs to some nice lady or sure is in the choir. I thought for a moment before answering, my mind a whirlwind of fear and confusion. The black one. The big one. It belongs to the lady who plays the organ. But she gets dressed with the singers too. That will do nicely, boy. She doesn't have to sing. I'll sing for both of us for miles and miles. Now you, my little friend, 
must sneak across to the church, up those stairs, and find the organ lady's purse. Don't try to bring it all back. All I need are the keys. Her little stash of cash would be a nice bonus, but that's just a suggestion. The keys are what's important. I couldn't think. My mind was swimming with uncertainty while my body ached to curl up on the ground and rest. The man shook me with impatience, his grip like a vice. You've got to do it. If you don't, I'll send you to hell in a minute and you'll never see your dear mother again. Ah, what we do to little boys when we get them there. But I don't want to scare you with that. Do this for me and I'll let you go back. You're a tough little one. I could see that right away, and smart. A little girl I wouldn't trust with this job. But you can do it and live to tell about it. The time you helped the devil himself. He turned me to face him again, and that wide mouth tightened into a line of determination. You see this gun, don't you, boy? Yes, I knew you had. As sure as I'm the devil himself. I can blow your little skull apart with this gun and send you to hell right now. Tears blurred my vision, but I wiped them on my sleeve, my heart pounding in my chest. I'll do it. Just let me do it and go away. I won't ever skip church, the man interrupted, his voice cold and menacing. Now that's all right. You do this little thing for me, and you'll have the devil behind you. Just don't make a racket and get yourself caught. No excuses. If you don't come back, I'll carry you away to where the sun never shines and little boys cry for all eternity. After one final look at that terrifying smile, I lunged from the forest toward the church. I could hear the low laughter over the soft padding of my feet and the quick gasps from my lungs. The wind cut through my thin clothes to my damp skin chilling me completely. I felt no relief as I increased the distance from the strange, awful man. The terrible, lonely responsibility weighed heavier than certain death. I hesitated for a second at the bottom of the steps, listening under the preacher's loud shouting for the sounds of other adults. Hearing none, I hurried up and slipped into the small room. Coats, sweaters, and hats dotted a score of folding metal chairs. I found the purses grouped together in a corner. It didn't take long to find the one I sought, a green leather purse large enough to hold a small dog. After frantic digging, I found the keys and was quickly out the door and down the stairs. I stopped at the edge of the woods, unable to see the man in the darkness. After a few hesitant steps, I listened carefully but could hear only the nighttime sounds of the forest. Relief was about to flood my mind when I turned slightly and focused on the man sitting just off to the side of the path. I was more shaken by the silent discovery than I would have been from a sudden gesture or noise. For what felt like an eternity, we stared at each other without moving. I raised an arm, unclasped a fist, and showed the keys. A long, even row of teeth appeared in the dark face. Ah, the keys. Well done, my boy, well done. Now we must give them a try. And quickly, for this silence probably means the prayer at the end of the sermon. That leaves a verse or two of him, a benediction, and then swift, sure discovery of your little theft. He rose and stepped to my side. Perhaps we'll be lucky and a few lost souls will choose this moment to step down the aisle and prompt another verse or two. I can't go with you. You said if I, the man grabbed me by both arms, his grip like iron. Now, now. I know what I said. Just come with me to the edge of town. If I let you go now, your hallelujahs might embarrass me in front of the congregation. The man tucked me under his arm his free arm ensuring no screams or cries escaped. As we crossed the parking lot, I, half-choked and dazed with fear, stopped struggling. The car started easily, and the man eased it slowly away from the church toward the highway. In a few moments, the town was behind us, 
and the man sighed with apparent relief. He kept an eye on the edges of the highway, his gaze shifting constantly. Need a little road, a nice quiet road for us to conclude our deal. I stirred in the front seat as the car left the highway and bounced along the ruts of a dirt road. My gaze fell on the black grip of the pistol peeking out from the loose clothing, and a desperate hope ignited. The man didn't stop until the road ended at the ruins of a burned homestead. A bleached chimney tilted over the weeds, a ghostly reminder of what once was. The man turned toward me and sighed again. You know, I make a pretty poor devil. Up till now, I've done my best with the role. He shook his head, a look of regret crossing his face. But I have to admit, temptation finally came my way. I mean, boy, I was actually tempted for a moment to let you go. I huddled in a corner as far from the massive figure as I could get. My fear was bottled and pushed away, replaced by a cold, calculating determination. My body buzzed with alertness, every nerve on edge. One small hand slid from a jacket pocket and crept along the seat. When I spoke, I didn't recognize my own voice, it sounded so distant and hollow. You promised. The man stifled a laugh, a sound that seemed to mock my desperation. Sometimes I promise too much, boy. I did threaten to send you to hell. The dark figure moved closer across the seat, his presence overwhelming. But since you are such a good little fellow, I'll send you to heaven instead. At the movement, I deftly snatched the pistol and pointed it at the massive head. I saw the startled expression on that monstrous face as my finger searched for a trigger that wasn't there. Confused, I jerked back against the window and, in the moonlight, stared in horror at the crudely carved piece of wood covered in black shoe polish. The same moonlight gave me one more sight of that awful smile as the man reached for me. Now, boy, let's see if you can follow through on a promise. Hope you enjoyed that spine-chilling story. Now, let's move on to the next creepy tale. This time, it involves a lady friend of mine. Are you ready to experience more terrifying moments together? Let's dive into the next story right away. Sure, I'll write a story in the first-person narrative style, based on the provided plot and themes. Here it is. The Sacrifice Winter's breath swept across the blackened expanse of the whispering forest, its sinister echoes dancing among the skeletal branches. I was known by many as the Nightmare Bird, a title earned in a thousand nights of darkness. My hunger for power led me here, to the precipice of winter solstice, demanding a sacrifice to feed the insatiable void within. With me, there was my sinister court. Harry the Beast, a hulking brood of matted fur and shadowy eyes, ever loyal yet dripping with his own unspoken ambitions. Flanking him were the goblins, Grizzle and Grim, their wicked grins revealing rows of yellow teeth. All awaited my command, their stealth and savagery primed for the hunt. The forest tonight was alive, but not with any familiar life. It whispered secrets, dark and arcane, as though the trees themselves reveled in the impending ritual. The moon hung pale and lifeless, offering its cold light to the twisted hem of our mission. My black feathers glistened under that eerie luminescence, and my breath misted in the frigid air. Tonight, we shall capture innocence itself, I declared, my voice cutting through the gloom like a blade. The sacrifice will usher in a new era of darkness, one where our power knows no bounds. Harry growled approvingly, his massive form shifting with anticipation. Grizzle and Grim exchanged eager nods before melting into the underbrush to scout the area, their dark little eyes darting greedily. Time passed slowly in the forest. Every rustle of leaves, every snap of a twig felt unnaturally loud, an orchestra of dread that played only for us. Then, soft footsteps echoed from somewhere deep within, a faint sound but unmistakably human. 
Harry's nostrils flared as he caught the scent. I nodded, and he slunk into the shadows, more beast than man, a predator on the prowl. The goblins returned, confirming our prize, a lone little girl, lost and sacred in her innocence, the perfect victim for our malevolent ritual. She was a small thing, no older than seven winters. Her auburn hair tangled, her face streaked with tears and dirt. She wore a red cloak that made her look like an unwitting lamb wandering into a wolf's den. Please, I'm lost, she whispered, eyes wide as the dark figures of her hunters closed in. Can you help me? The sight of her kindled a savage thrill within me. Here was purity, untainted, unguarded, ready to be devoured. Harry lunged with a speed that belied his bulk, ironclad paws outstretched to snatch the girl. But before he could make contact, something astonishing happened. The girl, with unexpected agility and strength, sidestepped the attack, grabbing a fallen branch and swinging it with all her might. It landed with a sickening thud against Harry's skull, sending the beast sprawling. The night shattered with his roar. Grizzle and Grim moved to intercept, but the girl moved like a phantom, darting and weaving with the grace of a seasoned warrior. I watched, transfixed, as she outmaneuvered the goblins, wielding her branch like a martial weapon, striking with precision and ferocity. Something was wrong, terribly wrong. This was not the helpless victim we had anticipated. Was it a trap? A test? My confidence waned, giving way to a gnawing dread. The girl locked eyes with me, and I saw in them not fear, but determination. She stepped forward, and an odd sense of calm enveloped the clearing. Her voice, now steady and sure, broke the silence. You seek darkness, but there's a greater power you've overlooked. My feathers ruffled in the cold, my beak gaped in astonishment. Before I could react, she reached into her cloak and produced a small, glowing crystal. Its light was blinding, purging the darkness, searing through the very essence of our collected wickedness. Who are you? I croaked, my voice faltering. I am hope, she said simply, and with those words, an overwhelming energy erupted from the crystal. It enveloped me filling every shadowy corner of my being with an unbearable light. I shrieked, thrashing against the blinding radiance, but it was futile. Harry, Grizzle, and Grim fell one by one, their monstrous forms dissolving into the forest floor as the girl's power surged. I felt my own strength waning, my dark feathers burning away, leaving me vulnerable, exposed. In my final moments, I realized the truth, the greatest threat to our malevolent intent had never been brute force or cunning, but the unyielding resilience of an innocent heart. Even in the face of our darkest designs, hope had found a way to conquer. The whispering forest swallowed the last echo of my scream. The girl stood amidst the remnants of our fallen court, the once sacred grounds now a testament to her indomitable spirit. For in the eternal dance of light and shadow, it is often the smallest, most fragile light that can shatter the deepest darkness. I guess you like that lady's story. So now, let's move on to the next spine-chilling tale. This time, we will hear from a mother's perspective. Are you ready to experience more terrifying moments together? Let's dive right into this mother's story. My name is Laura and I'm a single mother. I don't say this to gain sympathy or accolades, like some might. No, I tell you this because it's crucial for you to understand the situation I'm in, to fully grasp the severity of what's happening. I'm the mother of an 11-year-old girl named Emily. Emily just started fifth grade, a time when children are bursting with curiosity, a hint of mischief, and boundless energy. Emily embodied all these qualities, she was full of life, always ready for an adventure. However, everything changed after she met Alice. From what I've gathered, 
Alice was a new student who had transferred to Emily's school late in the term. From the moment they met, Emily became almost instantly attached to Alice. When I picked her up that first Monday after meeting Alice, Emily wouldn't stop talking about her new friend. Mom, Alice is amazing, she kept repeating, though her demeanor seemed off. She was pale, sweating, and looked unusually tired. When I checked her temperature, it was normal. That night, as I tucked Emily into bed, she pulled me close and whispered, You believe in magic, right, Mom? When I asked what she meant, she simply replied, about Alice. Alice knows spells. I smiled and reassured her before leaving her to sleep, but a knot of unease formed in my stomach. I couldn't shake the feeling that something was terribly wrong. The next few days were bizarre. Emily became more withdrawn, often chewing on her fingernails, something she had never done before. On Wednesday, Alice nearly frightened me by standing eerily close to our front door, staring in as if she had been waiting for us. When I asked Emily about Alice, she snapped out of her funk momentarily and excitedly talked about how they had formed the coven at recess and that Alice had given them eerie-looking charms. By Thursday, things took a darker turn. Emily began speaking about the shadow game and seemed terrified. She mumbled rules under her breath, refusing to tell me anything specific. Her behavior escalated to the point where she woke up screaming in the middle of the night. She was clearly haunted by something, and her fear was palpable. On Friday, despite my better judgment but hoping to get to the bottom of things, I allowed Alice to come over. She arrived almost immediately after we got home, bringing along a boy who introduced himself as Jackson. They appear out of nowhere and spoke ominously about the rules of the shadow game before leaving abruptly. Their presence left an unsettling chill in the air. Emily, now in a state of panic, revealed the horrifying truth about the shadow game, knowing its rules made you a participant, and losing meant being taken by Alice and Jackson through mirrors and open doorways. She implied that I had unwittingly become a player by learning these rules. The realization hit me like a ton of bricks. So here I am, a desperate mother, burdened with protecting my daughter from something malevolent and incomprehensible. I reached out for help, but I quickly realized that the world doesn't prepare you for the kind of terror I was about to face. The fear of the unknown loomed over us like a dark cloud. That night, I couldn't sleep. I lay awake in bed, every creak of the house making my heart race. Around 2 a.m., I felt a cold breeze brush my cheek and realized my bedroom door was slightly ajar. My mind raced back to the ominous rules Emily had mentioned, never leave doors open at night. I bolted out of bed and rushed to Emily's room, only stopping short at her doorway. Emily was sitting up in her bed, wide-eyed with horror, staring into her vanity mirror. The reflection in the mirror was not hers, but that of a dark figure, shrouded in shadow. Mom! Emily screamed, they're here. They're coming for us. Without thinking, I slammed the door shut and yelled for her to come to me. Emily leapt into my arms, and we both ran to the kitchen, the brightest room in the house. There, under the fluorescent lights, she finally calmed down enough to speak. I'm so scared, Mom. Alice told me that once you start the shadow game, you can't stop. They will come for you, through any mirror, any open door, she sobbed. They want your soul. I hugged her tightly and told her we would find a way to stop this. We spent the rest of the night in the kitchen, the lights on and all mirrors covered. The terror in her eyes was something I would never forget. The following morning, I decided to do some research. I thought it sounded absurd, but desperation pushed me forward. I googled everything related to Shadow Game, Alice, Jackson, and anything else that seemed relevant. 
I found various folklore and urban legends, but nothing concrete. Then I stumbled upon a forum discussing various paranormal activities. One post caught my attention, a woman described a similar game that her child had been invited to play by an imaginary friend turn real. She mentioned an entity named Elise who came to collect souls, and this child had to share the rules with another to survive. This eerie similarity made my skin crawl. Desperately, I contacted her through the forum, explaining my situation. Hours later, she replied with the following. To break free, you have to perform a protection ritual. It involves salt, mirrors, and a protective chant. More importantly, you have to sever the connection to Alice and Jackson by returning any items they gave your child and performing a cleansing on your home. Resting the computer aside, I hurried to the nearest store, bought salt, and gathered any mirror in the house. I then retrieved the charm Alice had given Emily, a small, weirdly carved stone, and wrapped it in a cloth. That night, I sat Emily down and explained the procedure. We lined the windows and doorways with salt and placed mirrors facing outwards in each room. As the final step, we buried the charm under the largest oak tree in our backyard as the woman instructed. While burying it, we recited the protective chant. Shadows be gone, light is our shield. Through salt and mirror, our bond is sealed. Darkness may call, but we shun its plight. With this chant, we embraced the light. As we completed the routine, a chilling breeze swept through the yard, sending a shiver down my spine. However, something felt different, like a weight had lifted, an invisible barrier erected around us. I hoped that this would be the end of our nightmare. Days turned into weeks, and the haunting nightmares and eerie visits diminished. Emily gradually returned to her old self, full of life and curiosity. Her nails grew back as she stopped biting them, and the shadows under her eyes faded. It was a slow process, but each day brought a little more normalcy back into our lives. Life seemed to return to normal. The entity and its ominous game disappeared from our lives. However, I can't deny a lingering paranoia that shadowed my thoughts. I don't think I'll ever fully trust a closed door or an unguarded mirror again. The fear that they might return always lingered in the back of my mind. One quiet evening, months later, the doorbell rang. My heart skipped a beat, but it was just a delivery, a package with no return address. Inside was a pristine, white envelope containing a single piece of paper, typed in a simple font. Remember the three rules. Vigilance is your true friend. E. Who is E? Elise? My mind raced, but a sense of gratitude filled me despite the cryptic warning. The message was clear, we could never let our guard down. The true nature of the shadows and their way of connecting players through fear remains a mystery. However, I now understand the importance of sharing this experience. Knowledge is both our curse and our shield against such malevolent forces. By telling our story, I hope to protect others from falling into similar traps. Shadows may lurk, but as long as we hold on to the light and share our stories, we can prevent others from becoming the next targets of the shadow game. The fear may never fully disappear, but together, we can stand strong against it. Hope you enjoyed that mother's experience. Now, let's move on to the next spine-chilling story. This time, we'll hear a stranger's confession. Are you ready to experience more terrifying moments together? Let's find out what he confessed and why. Forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. It's been three years since my last confession. My sin is murder. It was the toughest thing I had done in the three years since that awful night. But it was time. I could no longer carry the weight of what I had done, and I had made the decision to make things right, with both myself and with God. 
Please, tell me about your sins, the elderly and kind voice spoke to me through the partition. I remembered back to my childhood and to the Sunday visits to our church, how I couldn't understand how my parents could sit there and listen to the preacher but ignore what was taking place in his office. They had to have known, parents are supposed to know when something is wrong with their child, right? But they hadn't, and the visits continued for many years. It wasn't until my 14th birthday that the visits stopped. The church said that the preacher had moved on to study in South America, that he wanted to thank the church members for listening and for our devotion to God, and to apologize for leaving so quickly without goodbyes. The more likely reason, though, was that the church had found out. I took a deep breath. Three years ago, I went to an antique store with my best friend, Nathan. He was looking for something unique for his girlfriend's birthday. Rachel always had a thing for old stuff. We found this old music box. It was in decent shape, looked like it could have been from the early 1900s. Dark wood, brass inlays, a little crank on the side, the classic music box look. Anyways, we brought it back to his apartment, and as we carried it inside, it slipped and hit the ground. Surprisingly, it didn't cause much damage, but we did find that inside the box, a hidden compartment had popped open, and a small, ancient-looking key had fallen out. It was made of iron and had intricate designs etched into it. I don't really know, of course, but there was this, eerie aura about it. The voice on the other side of the partition made an him sound, and then the man asked, Tell me. What did these designs look like? Well, they were pretty worn down and old, but they looked kind of like runes, only that the patterns were all wrong. I see, the man responded. We looked at the key, but we had no idea what it was for, so we tossed it on the coffee table and picked up the music box again. Nathan and I got the music box into his room and set it on the dresser. It was a perfect match to their place. Like I said, Rachel had a real thing for vintage stuff. Nathan left to go pick her up from work, and I stayed at the apartment watching reruns of The Twilight Zone. I started to think about the odd key and googled the designs. It basically said that if you used the key to unlock the music box, it would open a gateway to another realm. Google's translation for the old dialect was a bit off, so I guess that's what it said. Anyways, I didn't believe in that type of thing three years ago. I didn't even believe in the supernatural three years ago, to be honest. I paused and thought. The man on the other side of the partition took the moment to comment. We're all lucky that the supernatural believes in us, even when we don't believe in it. Yeah, it took me a while to understand that, I replied. But I get it now. Funny how we all have a plan and that sometimes that plan takes pain to get started. Yes. Yes, it is. Please, go on. Well, I took the key to Nathan's room and examined the music box. There wasn't anything special about it. The wood was old like the box, maybe a bit off color around the edges. I think it used to be darker, but it's now a faded brown. Something about the key spooked me a little, maybe it was the quiet apartment, I don't know. But I decided that I would pick a word that wouldn't get used very often. So I looked around the room. Rachel had this collection of antique jewelry on their dresser. I'm sure they were all old as dirt, but I couldn't tell an old one from a new one if you set them right next to each other. Anyways... One of the pieces was this little silver locket with a swallow engraved on it. I decided that it would be a good word, and so I wrote swallow on a piece of paper and slipped it into the hidden compartment behind the music box. I closed the box and set it. A tear began to seep from my left eye as I recalled the night I lost my best friend and his girlfriend. Something terrible happened, didn't it? The kind voice asked pressing me to continue. Yes, I admitted. 
I closed the music box and said swallow. Then I heard this metallic scraping sound coming from the box. The box began to vibrate and hum. And then there was this wailing, not just a single wail, but wails of agony, despair, and rage. It was like someone had recorded all of the cries in the world and played them back all at the same time. I shuddered, still able to hear the sound in my head. You heard the sound of the other realm, the priest said. Yes, I said. But I didn't open the box. I was too scared. For some reason, I said swallow again and it stopped, as if nothing had happened. At that point, I couldn't stand being in there with that box anymore, so I ran from the apartment. The teardrops resting on my cheek multiplied, and I began to sob in earnest. I should have stayed, I cried. It's my fault they're gone. Your actions are understandable, the priest said in an attempt to console me. Any man would be afraid of the unknown, of undeniable proof that another realm exists. Now. Tell me what happened to Nathan and Rachel? I collected myself and continued. Well, I came back later that night to warn them. All of their rooms were dark, except for their bedroom, and for some reason, I decided to look in through the window, which is not like me. I'm not the type of guy that spies on people, I find that creepy, but there was the music box, and I needed to know what was happening. They were having an argument about something. They loved each other, but when they had a fight, it was like fire and ice. I never understood the term love-hate relationship, but then that's what they had. And this fight they were having was a good example. As I watched, Nathan grabbed Rachel by the shoulders and pushed her onto the bed in frustration. That's when Rachel got up and reached for the closest item she could find. She was standing by the dresser and picked up one of her antique lockets. I cringed as she cocked back her arm and let the locket fly. It hit the wall near Nathan, missing his face by inches, and I watched as it shattered into dozens of little silver pieces. I can remember seeing the dent in the wall after it hit. I don't know how they managed to get out of their fights unscathed. Guess it was always like that, always making a show but never really crossing that line. Like I said, it was a love-hate relationship. Anyway, I don't think Nathan could have seen me even if he had looked out the window. But from where I stood, I could see his lips moving as he yelled at her. Nice move, Rachel. Nathan screamed. I never liked those damn things anyway. Don't stop with the swallow. Throw another one, come on. I think I shrieked when the word came out of Nathan's mouth. Swallow. Oh, how I wish he hadn't said swallow. It's such a random word I never thought he'd say it. I watched in horror as the box jumped and the lid flew open. The wails seemed even louder, if that was possible. It was deafening. Nathan and Rachel both stopped in mid-argument. Rachel fled to the corner of the room by the headboard of the bed while Nathan took a few steps back. After several seconds, Nathan edged towards the box to see. I pounded on the window and tried to warn him, but it was too late. This shadowy figure reached out of the box and grabbed Nathan by the chest, ripping away his shirt and leaving huge gashes. There was blood everywhere. Then the figure climbed out of the box and did this odd, jerky walk up the bed towards Rachel. I could tell she was screaming, but it was lost in the other wails. Father, there was so much wailing. So, much, wailing. I struggled to retain my composure. Father nodded to signal that it was okay to continue. The rest is a blur. Another figure climbed out, then another and another, until there were at least eight in the room, thrashing things. Three of them fought over Nathan's body, tearing it apart like a chunk of meat being devoured by wild animals. Then they focused on Rachel, pinning her body to the bed. I turned and ran before I saw what they did to her, but I can imagine. 
The next morning, the street was blocked by police cars and news trucks. They said that a sinkhole had opened up under their bedroom, that both Nathan and his girlfriend were gone, likely buried under the rubble. But I know what really happened. I found the music box among the pile of rubble that had been piled on the street. The lid was closed again, and the wails had stopped, but I knew it was only a matter of time before someone accidentally said swallow and someone else would be dragged to the other realm. So I took it. I intended to destroy it, at first. The man behind the partition was quiet for a long time. I almost thought that he had left while I was speaking. Then he asked, where is the music box now? In an instant, rather involuntarily, I smirked. I couldn't help it. I placed it where it could do the work of the supernatural, I said. The only place I could think of where it could do its work. The priest was quiet. Please, Father, I asked, breaking the silence, does Father Matthew McClure still study here? Why, yes. He does, father replied. You know him? Perhaps a familiar face may age you've been through a lot. He holds private prayers with our youth during the afternoons, but for an old friend, I'm sure we could arrange a meeting. No, I said. It's been a long time since I was asked to pay a visit to Father McClare. I have a feeling the supernatural has other plans for him this day. Suddenly, the church shook, and we heard the sounds of people millions of people wailing, the sound coming from the office area of the church. I crossed myself and said a prayer before I left the confession booth. As I quickly made my way to the church's doors, the floor was already beginning to tilt towards the sounds, and now there was a new sound with it, the sound of the figures rising to drag the evil that had brought them to the surface. After hearing the other realm and physically seeing the figures, I truly believe. I know that what happened to Nathan and his girlfriend was accidental on my part, and that what I did to Father McClare was intentional, making it the moral sin of murder, but I think, I hope, in this case, that he'll make an exception. Hope you enjoyed that spine-chilling experience. Now, let's move on to the next creepy story. This time, we'll step into a mysterious grocery store. Are you ready to experience more terrifying moments together? Let's dive right into the next story. I work at a mom and pop grocery store in a small town in upstate New York. It's a quiet place where everyone knows everyone. My name is Alex, and I've been working here for about seven years. The job is easy, the customers are friendly and the pay is enough to get by. Everything was normal until a month ago when things started to get weird. It all began when a new guy, Kevin, started working the night shifts. Kevin was a strange guy, probably in his early thirties, with a demeanor that made everyone uncomfortable. He hardly spoke, and when he did, his voice had this eerie quality to it, like he was trying to imitate human speech and his laugh. A high-pitched cackle that could send shivers down anyone's spine. But we didn't have any solid reason to suspect anything untoward. My boss, Mr. Thompson, and I noticed that Kevin's shift coincided with a few odd incidents. At first, it was minor things, items would be slightly out of place, small amounts of cash missing from the register, but nothing significant enough to raise alarms. Then we started noticing that entire pallets of goods were disappearing overnight, biscuits, milk cartons, entire rows of canned beans, you name it. Naturally, Mr. Thompson suspected Kevin but, like any suspicious employer, wanted to catch him in the act. He reviewed security footage meticulously from the nights Kevin worked, but nothing out of the ordinary showed up. Kevin would do his rounds, help out customers, restock shelves, and mop the floors just like any diligent employee would. There was no sign of theft. 
One night, Mr. Thompson had to attend to a family emergency and asked me to review the footage. It was a Friday, so I took the tapes home, popped them in my old VCR, and settled in for what I assumed would be a boring night. The store isn't huge, so we only have four cameras, two covering the cashier area, one in the back room where we keep the stock, and another outside the entrance. Kevin started his shift at 6 p.m. Everything seemed ordinary, he counted the register, switched shifts with Clara, who worked the evening shift, and waited for customers. The first one was Mrs. Lowell, a chatty older lady who lives down the road. She picked up her usual, a loaf of bread and a carton of milk, paying with cash. The next customer was Tom, the town plumber. He grabbed a six-pack of beer and paid with his debit card. Then came a stranger, a tall man in a black trench coat and hat pulled low over his face. He bought $50 worth of groceries, paid with a crisp $100 bill, and left. So far, so normal. I was ready to call it a night when Mrs. Lowell came back. The timestamp on the video read 7.03. She picked up another loaf of bread and a carton of milk, paying with more cash. That was odd, but I shrugged it off. Ten minutes later, Tom came back, buying another six-pack of beer with the same debit card. Weird, but maybe he drank fast. At 7.20, the man in the trench coat returned, buying the exact same set of groceries and paying with another $100 bill. My skin began to crawl. This was beyond a strange coincidence. From 7.30 to 8 o'clock, the same sequence happened. Mrs. Lowell, Tom, and the man in the trench coat came back and bought the same items, paying in the same way. There was no mistake, they were the same people, repeating the same actions, down to the way they handed over their money. I fast-forwarded through the rest of the night. Every customer who had come and repeated their visit at the exact same time intervals, buying the exact same items, and making the same payments. It was like watching a looped video, but the rising and setting sun visible through the windows showed the passing of time. My heart pounded as I realized something sinister was happening. The one thing that stood out, Kevin always looked up at the camera, often with a chilling smile. At 12.03 a.m., his face filled the screen, staring directly into the lens. Unlike before, it was like he knew I would be watching. I couldn't move. After what felt like an eternity, his face vanished, replaced by an empty storefront. The shelves of canned beans had disappeared. Panic set in. I fast-forwarded further and watched Kevin continue his duties until he clocked out at 6 a.m. The same customers reappeared on schedule, buying the same items. Unable to sleep, I went to work early. Mr. Thompson was already there, looking exhausted. I shared the bizarre events with him, and we decided to watch the tapes together. The footage was exactly as I described, no skips. No obvious tampering. Kevin's eerie performance was undeniable. Kevin was due for another night shift, and we planned to confront him. But when 6 p.m. rolled around, Kevin didn't show up. We tried calling him, but his number was disconnected. We decided to review the footage again, hoping for more evidence. As we watched, something new caught our attention. In a section where the tape had previously appeared normal, there was a few seconds of static. When the picture restored, the shelves were empty, and Kevin was nowhere to be seen. We noted that this happened at exactly 12.03 a.m. Unable to explain the phenomenon, we called the local police. They were skeptical but agreed to check it out. That night, Two officers stayed with us to observe Kevin's shift. Kevin never showed. Yet, as midnight approached, the store changed. The air felt heavier, and the lights seemed dimmer. We all felt an inexplicable dread. 
At 12.03 a.m., the store's security cameras flickered and went black briefly before returning to normal. The officers were baffled but couldn't deny something strange was happening. They requested copies of the tapes for further investigation. As they left, the store clock turned to 12.33 a.m., and all returned to normal. Over the next few days, the police conducted interviews and surveillance but found no trace of Kevin. His apartment was abandoned, as if he had never been there. Meanwhile, the store continued to lose inventory during night shifts, and the weird looped behavior of the customers persisted. My boss decided to hire a paranormal investigator out of sheer desperation. The investigator, Helena, arrived with her team and equipment. They set up additional cameras and sensors around the store, planning to stay for the night shift. At 12.03 a.m., chaos erupted. The lights flickered uncontrollably, and everyone could feel an oppressive presence. The tapes later showed a foggy figure moving around the store, but Kevin didn't appear. Helena concluded that Kevin might have been a vessel for something otherworldly, something that could manipulate time and space. She performed a cleansing ritual, but the disturbances only lessened, they didn't disappear completely. Life returned to a cautious normal. Customers returned, their strange repetitive actions ceased, but every night, Kevin's face would sometimes momentarily flash on one of the cameras, always at 12.03 a.m., smiling that unsettling smile. The store became somewhat of a local legend, attracting curious onlookers and paranormal enthusiasts. Reports of similar incidents in nearby towns suggested that whatever had taken hold of Kevin might spreading. The authorities kept an open file on the case, but there were no new leads. My boss and I continued to work there, always attentive and alert. Years have gone by, and we haven't seen Kevin again. But every night, when the clock strikes 12.03 a.m., I can't help but feel a cold shiver down my spine, expecting to see his face, smiling back at me through the screen. Would he ever let us go, or was this just the beginning of something larger? Only time would tell, but one thing was certain, we were forever changed by Kevin's time loop. Hope you enjoyed that spine-chilling story. Now, let's move on to the next creepy tale. This time, we'll explore the redemption of a killer. Are you ready to experience more terrifying moments together? Let's dive right into the next story. I'm writing this from a secluded cabin deep in the woods, far away from the prying eyes of the world. I've taken every precaution to ensure my anonymity, but I know that the shadows of my past are never too far behind. You can call me Jay. It's a name that carries no weight, no history, and that's exactly how I want it. For years, I was a ghost in the underworld, a contract killer who operated in the shadows, taking jobs that most wouldn't dare touch. I was meticulous, professional, and above all, I was discreet. My clients were a mix of the desperate and the dangerous, corrupt politicians, cheating spouses, and ruthless gangsters. They all sought my services, and I delivered with a cold precision that earned me a reputation. But that was before the call that changed everything. It was a rainy night when I received the message. The kind of night that makes you want to stay indoors, wrapped in a blanket with a good book. But I was on the clock, and the job was waiting. The client was a faceless voice on the other end of the line, shrouded in secrecy. They wanted someone eliminated, a man named Victor, a former scientist turned whistleblower. He had information that could bring down powerful people, and they were willing to pay handsomely for his silence. I took the job without hesitation. After all, it was just another name on a list, another life to extinguish. I didn't ask questions, I didn't want to know the details. I was just the hired hand, and that's how I liked it. I arranged to meet my contact at a rundown diner on the outskirts of town. 
The place was dimly lit, with cracked vinyl booths and a jukebox that played the same old tunes on repeat. It was the perfect setting for a clandestine meeting. As I entered, I spotted my contact, a nervous-looking man in a wrinkled suit, fidgeting with a cigarette. He glanced around, ensuring no one was watching, before beckoning me over. I slid into the booth across from him, my expression unreadable. Do you have the information? I asked, cutting straight to the chase. He nodded, his hands trembling as he slid a folder across the table. Everything you need to know is in there. But, be careful. Victor isn't just some ordinary guy. He's involved in something much bigger. I raised an eyebrow, but I didn't let his words deter me. I opened the folder and scanned the contents. There were photos, addresses, and a detailed account of Victor's daily routine. It seemed straightforward enough. I pocketed the folder and left the diner, my mind already calculating the best approach. The following night, I set up my vantage point across the street from Victor's apartment. It was a nondescript building, the kind that blended into the background of the city. I watched as he came and went, taking note of his habits. He was a creature of routine, and that made my job easier. As the sun dipped below the horizon, I prepared my equipment, a silenced rifle, a scope, and a steady hand. I had done this countless times before, but something felt different this time. I brushed the feeling aside, it was just nerves. I focused on the target, my heart steadying as I zeroed in on Victor's silhouette through the scope. But then, something unexpected happened. As I watched him through the lens, I noticed a flicker of movement behind him. A shadow darted across the room, and my instincts kicked in. I adjusted the scope, my breath hitching as I caught sight of a woman, a young girl, bound and gagged, struggling against her restraints. Panic surged through me. This wasn't just a hit, it was a kidnapping. I hesitated, my finger hovering over the trigger. I had never been one to intervene but the sight of her terror ignited something within me. I couldn't just stand by and watch this unfold. I cycled the bolt and took a deep breath, my mind racing. I had a choice to make, follow through with the contract or save an innocent life. The weight of the decision pressed down on me, but in that moment, I knew what I had to do. I took the shot, but not at Victor. The bullet struck the chains binding the girl, shattering them and sending her tumbling to the floor. She looked up at me, wide-eyed and terrified, but I couldn't linger. I had to act fast. Victor turned, his eyes widening in shock as he realized what had happened. I quickly reloaded, aiming at him this time. He lunged for the knife on the table, but I was faster. The shot rang out, and he collapsed blood pooling around him. I rushed into the apartment, my heart pounding in my chest. The girl was still on the floor, trembling and wide-eyed. I knelt beside her, trying to reassure her. It's okay. You're safe now. But as I looked around the room, I felt a chill run down my spine. The walls were covered in strange symbols, and the air was thick with an unsettling energy. I had stumbled into something far more sinister than I had anticipated. I grabbed the girl's hand and led her out of the apartment, but as we stepped into the hallway, I heard a low growl echoing from the shadows. My instincts kicked in again, and I turned to face whatever was lurking behind us. What emerged from the darkness was a creature unlike anything I had ever seen. It was twisted and grotesque, with elongated limbs and eyes that glowed with a malevolent hunger. I felt a surge of fear, but I couldn't let it show. I had to protect the girl. I reached for my weapon, but it was too late. The creature lunged at us, and I barely managed to push the girl out of the way as it barreled past me. I fired a shot, but it only seemed to anger the beast. 
It turned its gaze on me, and I felt a wave of dread wash over me. In that moment, I realized that I had awakened something far more dangerous than I could handle. The girl scrambled to her feet, and we ran down the stairs, the creature hot on our heels. I could hear its claws scraping against the walls, and I knew we had to escape. We burst through the front door and into the night, but the creature was relentless. It chased us through the streets, its growls echoing in the darkness. I could feel the weight of my past closing in on me, the lives I had taken haunting my every step. We ducked into an alley, and I pulled the girl behind a dumpster, trying to catch my breath. Stay quiet, I whispered, my heart racing. I could hear the creature prowling nearby, its breath heavy and labored. But then, something unexpected happened. The girl looked up at me, her eyes filled with a strange determination. We have to fight back, she said, her voice steady despite the fear in her eyes. I hesitated, unsure of how to respond. I had spent my life taking lives, but I had never fought for one. But as I looked at her, I realized that I couldn't let her down. I had already made one choice tonight, I couldn't back down now. Okay, I said, my voice firm. But we need a plan. We scavenged the alley for anything we could use as a weapon. I found a rusted pipe, and the girl picked up a broken bottle. We waited in silence, listening for the creature's approach. When it finally emerged, I felt a surge of adrenaline. With a primal scream, I charged at the beast, swinging the pipe with all my might. The impact sent it staggering back, but it quickly recovered, its eyes filled with rage. The girl followed my lead, lunging at it with the broken bottle, her determination shining through. Together, we fought against the creature, our fear fueling our strength. I struck again and again, and with each blow, I felt the weight of my past lifting. I was no longer just a killer, I was a protector. Finally, with one last swing, I struck the creature's head, and it let out a deafening roar before collapsing to the ground. We stood there, panting and covered in sweat, staring at the lifeless body before us. In that moment, I realized that I had changed. I had crossed a line I never thought I would, and for the first time, I felt a sense of purpose. I had saved a life instead of taking one, and it felt liberating. The girl looked up at me, her eyes shining with gratitude. You did it, she said, her voice trembling with emotion. You saved me. I nodded, still trying to process everything that had just happened. We need to get out of here, I said, glancing around to ensure we were safe. As we made our way through the streets, I felt a sense of hope blossoming within me. I had spent years living in the shadows, but now I was ready to step into the light. I would no longer be a ghost, I would be a force for good. In the days that followed, I helped the girl find a safe place to stay. Her name was Emily, and she told me about the horrors she had endured while in Victor's captivity. He had been part of a cult, she explained a group obsessed with dark rituals and ancient powers. They had taken her as a sacrifice, and if it hadn't been for my intervention, she would have been lost forever. Emily's strength and resilience inspired me. She had faced unimaginable terror and come out the other side with a determination to fight back. I knew I couldn't just walk away from her now. I had to make sure she was truly safe and that the cult was dismantled. We spent the next few weeks gathering information and planning our next move. Emily had managed to escape with some of Victor's notes, which detailed the cult's activities and their hideouts. It was dangerous work, but I had a new purpose now, and I was willing to risk everything to see it through. One night, as we were poring over the notes, Emily looked up at me with a determined expression. We need to take them down, she said, her voice steady. We can't let them hurt anyone else. I nodded, feeling a sense of resolve. 
We will, I promised. But we have to be smart about it. We can't take them on directly. We need to gather evidence and expose them to the authorities. Emily agreed, and we set to work. We infiltrated their meetings, recording their rituals and gathering testimonies from other survivors. It was a dangerous game, but we were careful, always staying one step ahead. Eventually, we had enough evidence to bring to the authorities. It was a tense moment, handing over the files and hoping they would take us seriously. But the weight of the evidence was undeniable, and the authorities launched a full-scale investigation. The cult was dismantled, its leaders arrested, and its victims freed. It was a victory, but it came at a cost. I knew I couldn't go back to my old life, not after everything that had happened. I had crossed the line, and there was no going back. But as I watched Emily rebuild her life, I felt a sense of peace. I had found redemption, and it was worth everything I had sacrificed. I was no longer a ghost in the shadows, I was a force for good, and I was ready to face whatever came next. And so, here I am, in this secluded cabin, far away from the prying eyes of the world. I've taken every precaution to ensure my anonymity, but I know that the shadows of my past are never too far behind. You can call me Jay. It's a name that carries no weight, no history, and that's exactly how I want it. But now, it carries something else as well, a sense of purpose, a sense of hope. And for the first time in a long time, I feel truly alive. Hope you enjoyed that spine-chilling experience. Now, let's move on to the next creepy tale. This time, we'll visit a seemingly cozy neighborhood. But what terrifying stories might lurk within this warm community? Are you ready to experience more terrifying moments together? Let's dive right into the next story. I remember moving into this neighborhood like it was just yesterday. The memory is still vivid in my mind, clear as day. Actually, when I think about it, it wasn't that long ago, must have been about seven months ago when I first arrived. It all seemed perfectly normal, like any other place I had lived before. I had friendly neighbors, a nice house, and a decent job at the gas station in the nearby town. The community had a warm and welcoming atmosphere that made me feel at ease. Although my neighbors seemed cheerful and friendly, there was one who stood out as kinder than the rest. Her name was Amanda Robinson, and she lived in the house directly across from mine. Amanda looked about twenty, roughly my age, and had light brown hair, just like mine. Her eyes were a bright green, also like mine. We both had fair skin, although hers was a bit paler. She had a warm smile that was always on her face, and for some reason, she always had a few peppermints stuffed in her jeans pocket. I remember the first time I met her on the day I moved in, she offered me a peppermint, and I happily accepted. I noticed she didn't take one herself, but I thought nothing of it as we chatted about the neighborhood. She seemed genuinely interested in making me feel welcome, and her kindness was refreshing. While we were talking, I noticed someone standing in the open doorway of her house. It was a man, he looked around the same age as Amanda and me. He had short light brown hair and dark green eyes with dark circles underneath them. He was staring at me intensely, almost like he was trying to communicate something to me. His skin was pale, just like Amanda's, but he didn't have that same cheerful vibe that all the other neighbors did. I figured it was just because his right arm was in a sling and a brace was around his neck. There was something off about him, but I couldn't quite put my finger on it. His presence was unsettling, and I felt a strange tension in the air. Amanda noticed I was staring at the strange man and told me it was her brother, Stephen. I asked if he was okay, and she mentioned he had been in an accident recently but didn't give me any details. After she waved me goodbye, I watched her guide her brother back inside, 
and then they shut the door, and that was that. The encounter left me with a lingering sense of unease, but I brushed it off, thinking it was just my imagination. Weeks passed, and I grew to love the neighborhood. Everyone remained friendly and helpful, just like in those family movies. Still, there was something out about the place. I often felt strange vibes coming from the house across from mine. It was an uneasy feeling, like the calm before a storm. Whenever I asked about the Robinsons, people went quiet, only sharing a few nice things about them. Every time I glanced over at Amanda's house, I felt like someone was peering back at me. That strange feeling made me think of Amanda's brother, Stephen, and that intense gaze I encountered the first day. Just thinking about it made me shiver, those dark eyes felt like they were looking straight into my soul. I couldn't shake the feeling that he was trying to tell me something, something very important, maybe about the neighborhood or the people in it. While Stephen continued to creep me out, Amanda still made me feel welcome. Almost every day, I would see her leave her house to check her mailbox, get in her car to drive somewhere, or sometimes she would just walk to her destination. On weekends, she tended to her front lawn, and I would often offer to help. She always accepted, and whenever she saw me, she would offer a peppermint. I always took the little sweets, and I noticed she never ate one herself, not a single one. Still, it didn't bother me. The routine became comforting, and I started to look forward to our interactions. Amanda's presence was a constant in my life, and her generosity never wavered. A couple of months passed, and then it all started. One day began like any other. I woke up, got ready, had breakfast, and settled down in the living room. It was a Sunday, which meant no work for me. While I was flipping through the TV channels, I heard a knock at my front door. I wasn't expecting anyone, which piqued my curiosity. I opened the door, and there stood Amanda, with a smile on her face. I asked her why she knocked, and she quickly said, I hate to be a pain, but I need some help with my shopping. You wouldn't mind giving me a hand, would you? I agreed, and she led me across the street to her car, which was piled high with groceries. She thanked me for helping and asked me to take everything into her kitchen. As I did, I caught a glimpse of something out of the corner of my eye. Looking through one of the windows, I saw Stephen staring directly at me. While Amanda unpacked her groceries, I focused my attention on Stephen. He just stood there, watching me. His skin looked paler than I remembered, almost like he had lost all his color. His eyes were wide as if he had seen a ghost. For a second, I could have sworn he was shaking his head at me. His appearance was haunting, and I felt a chill run down my spine. Amanda seemed to notice my distraction and followed my gaze to the window. Clearly, she saw her wide-eyed, sick-looking brother there, and her smile faded quickly. I thought I heard her mumble something that sounded like, he shouldn't be up, before she stormed into the house. As soon as she vanished from sight, I turned back to Stephen. He looked panicked and alarmed, glancing between me and his right side before back to me. I saw him mouthing something. It looked like he was trying to shout, go, get away, urging me to run. I watched, feeling like I was in a TV drama. Before long, Amanda popped up in the window. She grabbed Stephen by the shoulders, seemingly trying to calm him down. I couldn't hear what they were saying, but she appeared to be reassuring him while he shouted frantic words. It was as if the man knew I was watching, and then she drew the curtains, cutting off my view. For a moment, I considered what to do next. The front door was still open, and the groceries remained there. I couldn't just leave it, could I? Picking up the nearest bag, I carried it up the front steps and into the kitchen. That's when I noticed something really strange, 
shelves in the kitchen lined with big jars filled with peppermint sweets, all brimming with the candy. It unsettled me to see how many jars were on those wooden shelves, there were enough for a lifetime. Then I recalled how every single time Amanda offered me a peppermint, she had never eaten one herself. So if she didn't eat them, why did she have so many? As I turned to leave through the front door, I spotted a small photo frame hanging on the wall. Looking closer, I saw it was a picture of two kids, a boy and a girl, who looked to be about the same age. They both had bright light hair and moss green eyes. They were smiling happily at the camera. The boy and girl reminded me so much of Amanda and Stephen. It must have been taken during happier times because it was the first time I had seen Stephen smiling. My train of thought was interrupted by a door closing. It was Amanda, coming out of what I assumed was the living room where I last saw Stephen. Her smile was gone, she wore an emotionless expression. She wasn't looking at me, her eyes were focused on the jars of peppermints. I tried to speak, but she interrupted me. I hate peppermint sweets, she said, her voice almost a whisper. You love them, don't you, Stephen? Her eyes were now locked on mine. It struck me, why did she call me Stephen? Did she mistake me for him? Maybe she just mixed up our names. No big deal. I opened my mouth to respond, but once more, she got in before me. I missed you for so long. That day you went missing all those years ago was the worst day of my life. All those other people looked like you, but they weren't you. I know it's you, Stephen. I know this is the real you. She gave me a crooked smile and began to slowly advance on me. My gaze darted from her to the picture of the two children. The boy did look a lot like me, but surely Amanda didn't think I was him. What did she mean by all those other people? As I stood there frozen, I noticed a shiny metallic object in Amanda's hand, a knife covered in blood. Now I understood what Stephen had been trying to tell me. He was warning me to get away from his sister, she was insane. The front door was still open, and I was only a few steps away when I felt a sharp stabbing pain in my upper back. Amanda had plunged the knife into my flesh and covered my mouth with a strange smelling rack. I yelled in pain, but it was muffled by the cloth. My hands flailed and reached for the open door, but it was no use. The world around me faded to darkness. My body went limp. The last thing I heard was Amanda's voice saying, We'll be a family again, Stephen. It's been a few months since I moved into my new home. I sit in my comfortable chair by the living room window, and the sun shines brightly outside like a beacon. It's been ages since I went outside, and it shows in my pale skin. I look over at my house across the street. It's been empty for a while, but apparently, new neighbors are arriving today, that's what I heard, anyway. I feel an itch in my arm under my cast, it irritates me, but I try my best to ignore it. My fingers move up to my throat, and I can feel the sloppy stitching closing up the wounds there. Suddenly, a sweet voice calls out from the doorway, Don't touch your stitches, they won't heal otherwise. I don't even try to answer. The brunette is standing there. It's pointless anyway, it's hard to talk without a tongue. The woman walks over and swats my hand away from my injured throat. She leans down at me and I give a faint smile back. She still scares me after everything that happened, but I have to admit, she doesn't seem as crazy anymore, not after getting her brother back. The young woman reaches into her jeans pocket and pulls out a handful of peppermints. I feel sick just looking at them. They're all I've been fed over the past few months. I give her a pleading look, but she beams down at me, extending her hand. Giving in, I take the sweets, and it seems to make her happy. How are your injuries doing, Stephen? she asks, as she goes to check my bandage. 
Just before she can, a noise outside catches her attention. It's the sound of a moving van pulling up outside my old house. Both of us stare out the window at the van and the people coming out of it. There's also another car parked right in front. A family gets out of the car, an elderly looking man and woman, a young girl, and a young man. The young man looks around 20, with short light brown hair, moss green eyes, and slightly pale skin. I glance over at Amanda to see her warm smile turn into a wild grin. Without hesitation, she sprints to the front door of our house and steps outside. I watch through the window as the young woman eagerly greets the family. A strange emotion washes over me, I'm not sure if it's worry for the young man or fear for myself. Another feeling spreads through me like a virus, it's the unsettling sensation that I'm no longer needed. Hope you enjoyed that spine-chilling tale about the neighborhood. Now, let's move on to the next creepy story. This time, the protagonist discovers a strange manhole cover behind their new home. Are you ready to experience more terrifying moments together? Let's dive right into the next story. Brooklyn and I had always dreamed about having our own little space. Over the years, we talked endlessly about what it would be like to have a place that we could call our own, a sanctuary away from the chaos of our everyday lives. So, when the chance finally came, we seized it with both hands. The property we selected was modest by most standards, a quaint, charming abode consisting of just one bedroom and a single bathroom. But for us, it was more than adequate, it was everything we had ever wished for. It was a realization of a shared dream, nestled far from the bustling city life that we had been entangled in for what seemed like an eternity. Our love for nature and our mutual passion for adventure had guided us to this serene haven in a quaint little place named Smithland, which lay hidden amidst the thick, enchanting forests of the Pine Barrens in New Jersey. The moment we set foot in Smithland, we were enveloped by an atmosphere that was subtly different. The town exhibited a quiet strangeness that was palpable yet unspoken. The residents of Smithland were exceedingly reserved, their interactions marked by a distant politeness that felt almost rehearsed. Their demeanor was so unwaveringly quiet that it bordered on the unreal, and they appeared to keep to themselves more than any community we had encountered before. Even the real estate agent who introduced us to our new home radiated a peculiar vibe. His responses were succinct to the point of being terse, and an air of persistent unease seemed to cling to him as if haunted by some unseen fear. Dismissing his behavior as mere reticence, we were brimming with anticipation to begin this new chapter amidst the idyllic scenery. A month slipped by, and in that time, we focused on making our new home truly ours. Our budget was tight, making extravagant renovations unfeasible. Instead, we turned our attention to small yet significant projects, starting with the yard. One particularly bright and sunny afternoon, I found myself in the backyard, lost in the task of pulling up stubborn weeds. It was at that moment that I unearthed something surprising, a manhole cover. The sight startled me, the notion of a manhole in such an isolated area was incongruous. My curiosity, always insatiable, urged me to explore further. I retrieved a crowbar from the old garden shed and began the painstaking effort of prying open the mysterious manhole cover. The sight that met me was an impenetrable abyss, a darkness disrupted only by the faint glint of the rusty rungs of a ladder leading downwards. The sensation of unease that crept over me was potent, yet my curiosity overpowered it. I descended into the unknown. At the bottom, I rummaged through my pocket for my lighter and struck it to shed some light on the grim surroundings. In the flickering glow, the walls emerged, festooned with an arsenal of knives, casting eerie shadows. At the center stood a solitary desk equipped with a knife sharpener, 
and prominently displayed upon it was an old clown mask. The mask was unsettling, with leather straps at the back for fastening, distinctly different from any typical mask I had ever seen. With a shiver running down my spine, I set the mask aside and turned my attention to a large, dusty box situated next to the desk. As I brushed away the layers of dust, an old film projector and a reel of film came into view. The discovery piqued my interest further, fueling my curiosity about the hidden history within our new home. With a sense of intrigue, I carried the film projector and the reel upstairs, determined to uncover whatever secrets were stored on the reel. I carefully drew the shades and dimmed the lights to create the optimal conditions for viewing. As the projector whirred into life, the room was filled with grainy images depicting a birthday party from the 90s. The footage showed a joyful couple, their faces beaming with smiles as they embraced and watched a clown entertain their child and friends. I couldn't help but notice that the clown's makeup bore an uncanny resemblance to the mask I had found underground. Just as the footage seemed to taper off, the film cut abruptly to black for what felt like an interminable time before resuming with much more disturbing scenes. The lens now focused on the woman from earlier, her previously joyous expression replaced by a blank, emotionless stare. Around her, children still played, but their faces now bore expressions of stark terror. Emerging from the shadows was a man, a much darker, more malevolent figure than the previously smiling father. This man's very presence was suffocatingly sinister. He was muscular in a grotesquely intense way. In a fit of rage, he let out a horrifying yell and overturned a table with frightening ease. Charging towards the clown, he threw him violently to the ground. With methodical terror, he began sketching on his own face with a marker before slicing through his skin with a knife, fashioning a mask from his own flesh. The horrific mask was identical to the one I had found earlier. He then systematically executed each guest, sparing no one, not even the children. My heart pounded in my chest, the horrifying realization settling in like a dense fog. The events unfolding on the screen had taken place directly beneath our new home. Panic surged through me, but my primary concern was Brooklyn. I decided to keep this terrifying discovery to myself, determined to preserve the peace of our new sanctuary. That night, despite the physical exhaustion from the day's labor, sleep was elusive as the haunting images replayed incessantly in my mind. Brooklyn returned home late from work, her eyes widening with concern when she found me still awake. Why are you still up, love? She asked softly. I kissed her gently and encouraged her to nestle into bed, hoping her presence would bring some semblance of comfort. But sleep continued to evade me. Drawn to the window, I stare out at the storm that raged violently the streets below shrouded in a menacing haze. And then I saw him. Across the street, barely discernible in the night shadows, a dark figure watched me. Though his face was obscured, a wave of chilling recognition washed over me. The figure reached for something at his waist, a gun. A loud bang echoed, piercing through the symphony of the storm. But no bullet struck, it was a blank a disturbing display of power and control. As dawn broke, bringing with it a mere three hours of restless sleep, I trudged to the kitchen where I was met by Brooklyn's intensely concerned expression. What happened last night, Daniel? Her voice trembled slightly. I forced a casual shrug, implying that I was merely adjusting to our new home, though the guilt gnawed at me as her concern deepened. The days blurred into weeks, each marked by a harrowing routine of hypervigilance. My waking hours were consumed by obsessive work on the house, a desperate attempt to distract myself from the dread that had taken root in my mind. The nights were a far grimmer affair, haunted by the horrific images from the film and the sinister man's threatening presence. 
sleep became an elusive luxury, and paranoia steadily gnawed at my sanity. As exhaustion dulled my paranoia, it created a fragile illusion of safety. I started to convince myself that Bob, as I had started to call him, was gone. Surely, if he intended to harm us, he would have done so by now. Yet, my sleep-deprived mind continued to play tricks on me, distorting my perception of reality. Two weeks passed without a sign of Bob. I allowed myself a tentative sigh of relief. One night, amidst a raging lightning storm that lit up the heavens, I decided to unwind with some mindless TV while Brooklyn was at work. But every flash of lightning resurrected the gruesome scenes from the film, whispering doubts into my mind. Suddenly, the power cut out abruptly, shattering my fragile calm. With my heart racing, I grabbed the largest knife I could find from the kitchen and seated myself uneasily by the dining table. Hours felt like eternities as the storm continued its relentless assault outside. Gradually, exhaustion overtook me, and I fell into a shallow, fitful sleep, waking with a start at 11.53 p.m. Brooklyn still hadn't returned. A sharp, metallic scraping sound pierced the silence. I froze as the noise intensified, tracing the periphery of the house until it reached the front door. A series of slow, deliberate knocks ensued, each growing louder, more insistent. The door splintered, crashing open as heavy footsteps echoed ominously through the hallway. Panic surged as I stumbled towards the living room, only to be blindsided by a powerful blow, plunging me into darkness. When my vision cleared, lightning revealed the masked face of Bob, his grin twisted and menacing. In his hand, he held a severed head. A heartbreaking realization dawned as I locked eyes with Brooklyn's lifeless gaze. Grief and guilt tore through me as Bob taunted, you should have told her. His rage was matched by the sadistic precision of his actions. Mutilating me viciously, he ensured I would never call for help, see, or hear him again. Now, I lie in a growing pool of my own blood, pain my only companion. My hope is shattered, but I desperately cling to a delusion. If I can just find her. Brooklyn. Maybe I can fix this. I can make everything right. I will hold her again, I keep telling myself. But deep within, I know this is just a desperate grip on the fringes of sanity born from an overwhelming horror. Hope you enjoyed that spine-chilling experience. Now, let's move on to the next creepy story. This time, a friend of mine landed a job that pays $37 an hour. 37 per hour with no experience required seemed almost miraculous, especially with my increasing bills and the looming threat of eviction. Given my desperate situation, it felt like a lifeline. Without a moment's hesitation, I dialed the number provided and arranged for an interview the following day. Little did I know that this hasty decision, born out of desperation, would lead me into a living nightmare from which escape seemed nearly impossible. The next day, I arrived at the address provided, located in a part of the city where even GPS signals seemed reluctant to venture. The building was a massive, decrepit warehouse, devoid of any discernible signage or identifying marks. Its isolation was unsettling, having been left to the encroaching weeds and broken pavement, an indication that it had been forgotten by time itself. The sheer desolation of the place sent a chill through me and raised the hairs on the back of my neck. I took a deep breath and mustered the courage to push through the rusted metal doors. My footsteps echoed ominously in the vast, empty lobby, heightening the eerie ambience. An inexplicable sensation of being watched clung to me, making my skin crawl. Inside, I was directed to a small, temporary-looking office where Mr. Harris, the interviewer, awaited. Despite the rundown setting, he was impeccably dressed, which only served to amplify the oddity of the situation. 
We need someone to start immediately. Can you do the night shift tonight? He inquired, his smile never quite making it to his eyes, which remained cold and calculating. Yes, I can, I responded, forcing myself to suppress the knot of apprehension tightening in my stomach. Great. Report here at midnight, he said, handing me a laminated sheet listing my instructions and rules. After a firm handshake, I exited the office, my mind buzzing with thoughts of the hefty paycheck that awaited me. The promise of a good salary was enough to make me momentarily forget the strange unease that had settled over me. As the clock struck midnight, I found myself trudging back through the deserted streets towards the warehouse. The chill in the night air bit at my skin, adding to the sense of foreboding. Pushing through the doors once again, the oppressive silence welcomed me like an old, unwelcome friend. The interior was a confusing maze of dark corridors, where flickering fluorescent lights cast eerie, shifting shadows. After navigating the labyrinth and hallways, I found the security room, an old, cramped space equipped with a bank of monitors displaying various empty rooms and hallways. At first glance, everything seemed straightforward enough until my eyes fell upon a large, laminated sheet taped above the desk. The rules inscribed there were strange, almost absurd. Do not leave the building between 1 a.m. and 3 a.m. under any circumstances. If you hear a woman singing, do not investigate. Lock the door and wait until it stops. If you see any entity without eyes on the screens, do not look directly at it. Ignore it completely. Only use the provided flashlight. Do not bring your own light sources. Do not answer any knocks on the door after 2 a.m. I laughed nervously at the absurdity of these rules, but my amusement was short-lived. A sinking feeling took hold of me, making me question what I'd gotten myself into. Standing alone in the small, confining room, the heavy silence seemed almost palpable, adding to my growing sense of vulnerability. By 1 a.m., my initial apprehension had given way to an oppressive tension. My eyes were glued to the monitors as I noticed a shadowy figure in the northwest corridor, right on the edge of the camera's view. I blinked, and it was gone. I tried to convince myself that it was just a glitch or perhaps my tired eyes playing tricks on me, but a gnawing doubt spurred my anxiety. The minutes dragged on agonizingly. Every creak and groan of the old building was amplified, resonating like distant echoes in a cavernous void. Just before 2 a.m., the faintest strains of a woman's voice reached my ears, singing a haunting melody that sent shivers down my spine. I froze in place, my heart pounding. Remembering the rules, I quickly locked the door. The singing grew louder, filling the room with its eerie beauty. I sat in the chair, paralyzed with fear, trying to ignore the chilling harmonies. Minutes felt like agonizing hours before the singing finally faded away, leaving behind a silence even more oppressive than before. At 2.30 a.m., my eyes widened in horror as I saw an eyeless figure on one of the screens. It stood motionless in the hallway, facing the camera, its hollow, empty sockets staring directly at me. My breath caught in my throat as I recalled the third rule. Forcing myself to look away, I focused intently on a blank spot on the desk. Every second felt like an eternity. When I finally dared to glance back at the monitor, the figure had vanished. Time seemed to distort and warp, every noise and shadow taking on menacing qualities. My paranoia grew, intensifying my fear. Each passing moment felt like an ordeal, a test of my resolve and sanity. The rules that had initially seemed ridiculous now felt like a fragile barrier separating me from some unspeakable horror lurking in the bowels of the warehouse. Somehow, I managed to survive the night, my nerves frayed and my body utterly exhausted. As the first light of dawn broke, a wave of relief washed over me. 
I had made it through. But my moment of victory was short-lived. Just before leaving, I glanced one last time at the monitor. There, staring back at me, was the same eyeless figure, this time closer, impossibly closer. A chill ran down my spine as I stumbled out of the building, the image burned into my mind. Days passed, each one filled with an escalating sense of dread as my next shift loomed closer. The money was good, but the cost to my sanity was becoming intolerably high. With each successive night, the occurrences became more frequent and more terrifying. The singing was more frequent, the eyeless beings more numerous. The feeling of being watched intensified, becoming more invasive, more personal. One particularly harrowing night while on patrol, I heard footsteps behind me, slow and deliberate, as if someone was intentionally trying to scare me. My provided flashlight flickered and died, plunging me into darkness. I fumbled with it desperately, the echo of the footsteps growing louder, closer. When the light finally came back on, there was nothing there, only the haunting echo of footsteps ringing in my ears. The psychological terror was relentless. I felt as though I was teetering on the edge of insanity. Each shift was a grueling test of endurance, a nerve-wracking dance with unseen horrors that left me more shaken and fragile. I began to question my own reality, doubting everything I saw and heard. Sleep was fitful and scarce, plagued by nightmares of eyeless faces and eerie, mournful songs. On my final night, as I prepared to leave the job for good, I encountered something that pushed me to the brink. As I walked through the darkened corridors one last time, an overwhelming sense of dread enveloped me. My footsteps echoed ominously through the empty halls as I made my way toward the exit. As I reached the doors, I froze, paralyzed with fear. There, reflected in the glass, was my own face. But instead of eyes, there were hollow, empty sockets staring back at me, reflecting the soul-crushing terror within. I turned and fled the building, heart racing, fear clawing at my sanity. The image stayed with me, an indelible reminder of the horror I'd endured. Even now, as I strive to move on, the memory of that reflection haunts me. The job that I had promised so much had exacted a far greater toll than I could have ever imagined. Wherever I go, I can't shake the feeling that I am still being watched, that somewhere, those eyeless beings are waiting. The seemingly high salary and simple job description had all been part of a cruel trap, one that ensnared me in a web of fear and madness. As I navigate my new life, I can't help but feel that the horrors I encountered are not confined to that building. Sometimes, late at night, I hear the faint strains of a woman's voice, singing that same haunting melody, and I wonder if I will ever truly be free of the $37 per hour trap. The specters of those nights whisper their secrets, keeping me on edge, never letting me forget. The sense of being watched lingers a constant reminder of the terrible price I paid. Hope you enjoyed that spine-chilling experience. Now, let's move on to the final creepy story. This time, we'll hear a tale about a forensic scientist. Are you ready to experience more terrifying moments together? Let's dive right into the next story. I'm a forensic doctor, and for several years now, I've been delving into the underbelly of life and death. Many claim that each soul narrates a unique story, and it falls upon my shoulders to unfold these silent tales. The first encounter with the morgue is invariably a chilling one, as the reality of life extinguished strikes hard. As time rolls on, that initial shock morphs into a familiar backdrop cold, clinical, devoid of the morbid curiosity that once was. The sterile environment, the cold steel tables, and the ever-present scent of antiseptic become the norm, a part of the daily routine that no longer invokes the dread it once did. By now, 
I've grown accustomed to the strange occurrences that flit through the morgue's dimly lit halls. Whispers of ghosts, subtle movements of lifeless bodies, and even the eerie trickle of disembodied screams, such phenomena no longer faze me. The spectral figures that occasionally appear at the periphery of my vision, the inexplicable cold spots that seem to move with a will of their own, and the sudden, untraceable breezes that ruffle papers and chill the skin, these have all become part of the background noise of my existence. But the day a corpse sat up to ask for someone was a first, an aberration that set my seasoned nerves alight. It was an otherwise ordinary day when this unsettling saga began. The sky outside wept incessantly, and the morgue was busier than usual. A procession of bodies arrived, each one carrying the peculiar scent of death that lingered in the air. My assistant and I were buried under an avalanche of reports when the sound of footsteps echoed through the hallway. Ordinarily, we'd pay little heed to such things, especially nearing 10 p.m., a time when the night staff typically arrived. The rhythmic thudding of shoes on the linoleum floor, the occasional creak of the old building settling, these were sounds we had learned to ignore. However, no one entered despite the footsteps halting by our door. We brushed it off, assuming the guard had simply checked in on us without wanting to disrupt our work. Two hours slipped by, and the guard finally stopped in to say good evening. Almost done, he inquired. Yeah, just finishing the last report, I replied, weariness edging into my tone. The long hours and the relentless parade of the dead had taken their toll, and I was looking forward to the end of my shift. By the way, where's the intern? he asked, seemingly puzzled. I saw her in the hallway earlier, said she was coming to see you. Confusion washed over my assistant and me. We don't have any intern, I responded, frowning. Especially not at this hour. The morgue was not a place for visitors, especially not late at night. The guard's laughter was abrupt, don't joke around. I spoke to her. Tall girl, red hair, freckles, and a scar near her right eye. My assistant went pale. Did she have a mole on her cheek too? He asked, voice trembling. The description matched someone we knew all too well. Yes, that's her. The guard confirmed, his own confusion mirrored in our faces. Come with me, directed my assistant, leading the guard towards one of the cold chambers. With a steady yet reluctant hand, he pulled back the sheet covering one of the corpses. Here she is, he said, voice barely a whisper. The lifeless form beneath the sheet was unmistakable. The guard's face lost all color. With eyes wide and breath caught in his throat, he recognized her instantly and stumbled back, racing down the hallway in sheer terror. I followed, intent on helping, but he vanished into the night, his fear leaving a trail of unanswered questions. Returning to the morgue, I found my assistant confirming the girl's death. She was cold, still unequivocally deceased. Our shift neared its end and replacements arrived as we prepared to leave. Yet, as we stepped away from the girl's body, I saw something that froze the blood in my veins, her torso lifted, eyes locking onto my assistant. She asked for her boyfriend in a voice that defied death itself. We bolted, hearts thundering in our chests, her cries pursuing us long after we reached the safety of the next room. Make sure you've checked properly next time. I shot at my assistant, struggling to steady my voice. The sight of the dead moving, speaking, was something no amount of experience could prepare one for. I did, he insisted, equally shaken. No vital signs. She'd been here for 48 hours. It makes no sense. The certainty in his voice was unshakable, yet the evidence of our eyes told a different story. The gravity of the guard's terror dawned on us. Hastily, we collected our belongings, eager to leave the haunted stillness behind. Once outside, 
I share what had transpired with the incoming shift. The senior forensic doctor, a man aged by decades of dealing with death, simply nodded. No need to fear, he said with an unsettling calmness. Some souls cling stubbornly to life, willing the body to express their final emotions. Love, regret, unfinished business, they manifest in ways we may never understand. His words, though meant to reassure, only deepen the mystery. His explanation, delivered with such nonchalance, added to the terrifying mystery. I barely survived that night, sleep eluding me as I wrestled with the events that defied logic. Tomorrow, a fresh day dawned, filled with resolve to unravel the mystery echoing through the cadaver-filled halls. How's your night? A colleague asked upon my return, noting my haggard appearance. The toll of the previous night's events was evident in my weary eyes and drawn face. Restless, I admitted, still haunted. Did anything unusual occur during the night? The question hung heavily in the air, laden with the weight of my recent experiences. As he divulged the morning's findings, my pulse quickened. When you left, I checked on the girl. She was sprawled on the floor, scratches marring the surface as though she tried dragging herself. It's extreme body spasms, of course, but this, it's unprecedented. The image of her lifeless form, contorted in apparent agony, was burned into my mind. Even he, a veteran in the field, was astonished. The corpse bore a look of profound anguish, a silent scream frozen in her final moments. Was she trying to convey a message, a story itching to break free? Let's examine her, I proposed, lifting the mysterious girl onto the table once more. Closing the drawer, we barely had a moment's peace before a faint scraping sound alerted us again. The drawer had opened, ominously ajar despite being firmly shut minutes ago. Edges frayed by the supernatural, I approached, fear gnawing at my insides. The corpse had repositioned itself, curling into a fetal position, nails digging into skin as though clutching at life itself. I whispered, the pain will pass, I promise. As we closed the drawer once more, my assistant beside me, tension lay thick like the fog outside. That day, the seasoned doctor approached me, his demeanor serious. It's our duty to listen, he said, words heavy with unseen meaning. Talk to the criminalist handling her case. Discover where she was found, understand her story. His advice, though simple, resonated deeply. The words struck home. The girl's tale was one of agony and transcendence, tethered to the living with a desperation that defied death. The criminalist could offer clues, could lead us down the path that illuminated her final moments. As the dawn peeked through the sterile windows of the morgue, we gathered our courage, ready to delve into a mystery that blurred the lines between life and the hereafter. For in the end, every soul deserves a voice, and it was my solemn oath to be that voice in the quiet, echoing halls of the morgue. The weight of this responsibility pressed heavily on my shoulders, but it was a burden I was willing to bear. Thank you for joining me on this chilling journey through the shadows of life and death. If you enjoyed this story, don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit the bell icon for more spine-tingling tales from Whispers of Terror. Remember, every soul has a story, and here, we give them a voice. Until next time, stay curious, stay cautious, and keep whispering with terror.